Okay. So welcome everybody. It's so exciting to have you in class today. So my name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, and I'll be here to kind of moderate you through this class today. We're here with one of the top scholars from the National Constitution Center, Tom Donnelly. Tom, do you want to say hi to everybody? Hi, everyone. Can't wait to get started. We are so excited, and we've been pre-gaming this before you guys got on. Civil liberties is the topic of today's class. We're gonna dive through the history, but we're really gonna start in the beginning with Tom, help us understand what is the concept of civil liberties? We hear people say it all the time. They're like, oh, our civil liberties must be protected. What does that really mean? What are civil liberties? And then we'll dive through like, where did the ideas come from and how have they changed over time and how do we define them today in the world that we see? Sure, Curry. So I think the easiest way, the simplest way to think about civil liberties are these are really our, really our most cherished liberties. They're just that. Things like freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, the rights of, accused, the, rights of the accused, things like that. And so what they, what they really derive from is this idea that, you know, it's really what we see in the Declaration is that we are all born free and equal with certain unalienable rights. And these are rights that we have against the government. These are rights that we can really lay claim to as individuals and that the government can't infringe. And so what we see through the course of American history is we will do really, I think, three separate things. You know, one is continue to define what these rights are. Two, sort of apply them in different ways and in different contexts. And three, think differently about how strongly we want those protections to apply against different forms of government, beginning with the British Empire moving to the national government, and eventually to the states. And so I think that's, that's at least a, a, a basic way to understand it, Curry. And I think it's really helpful because so many times in class, we start with the constitution and we say, okay, let's look at the text and what it says, but civil liberties are sprinkled throughout and they're almost like values that we have. So we have like the, this listing of like big ideas. What are civil liberties? How are they connected to the freedom and the bill of rights and the basic fundamental freedoms that we have? And then what are the major questions today that are testing civil liberties? But we also group these together, these ideas, and we'll go through these throughout time, but how have the courts played a role in protecting civil liberties? The idea of freedom of speech and religion, those natural rights that Tom just talked about, how are they based, based, that's our foundation, our basement to building the structure of freedom we have in America. What is due process? How do we see privacy as a part of this? equal protection, my favorite thing, incorporation, we'll talk about that a lot when we get to 14th Amendment, and then habeas corpus, show me the body. That's at least how I explain it, Tom. That's my very like modern take on habeas corpus. So these are some of the big ideas because sometimes in the constitution, these ideas aren't always directly written, but they're implied and they're values of it. So we wanted to expose you guys to all these ideas and then dive into where did this come from? Where was the genesis of this? So Tom, do you want do you want to start with the Declaration of Independence talking about where we begin? Yeah, let's start there, Curry. And I mean, even before the Declaration, I think the one thing to keep in mind as we're talking about this is, you know, don't get too bogged down by the precise words used to describe these things. They change over time. So the founding generation, if you were to ask them about civil liberties, they wouldn't really use that term, but they would say something like natural rights. Or even during the revolution, they would say the rights that we have as members of the British Empire. And then over time, it would change. We'd start to see a few people talk about things like civil liberties during the Civil War in the late, uh, the late 1800s. And then once we get into the 20th century, it becomes a more and more prevalent way to think about rights. So I just want to, you know, but really think about the big idea here is these are the things we cherish most. These are the rights of individuals that we cherish most. It is important because if I went to like an old document, like the Declaration of Independence and like did a Google search for civil liberties, it's not going to pop up. It wasn't a word used at that time, but the idea and the value was there. Okay, so tell me about the Declaration. Where do you hear it in the Declaration? I give you a, a visual cue there too. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can both hear it and see it. It is the most famous line maybe in any American document other than maybe we the people. Here it is. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, 
liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And again, this is for the, for the founding generation. The idea here is that these are fundamental natural rights. These are rights that we don't get from the government we get from God or from nature these rights, and that these are things that we can protect against abuses by the government. And so, you know, we will, again, we'll, we'll sort of spell out these rights over time, but if you go to the rest of the Declaration of Independence, you'll get a taste of what they had in mind, because we have this grand, you know, the grand statement at the beginning of the Declaration, but through the rest of the Declaration, a lot of it is Thomas Jefferson and the members of, 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 the, uh, the, the, of Congress explaining what is it that the British Empire did wrong? And so much of what they're explaining and what they're complaining about and what they're saying, these, this is why we need a revolution, is that the British Empire, the king, is violating our most fundamental liberties. And these are things like the right to privacy in our home. These are things like the right to a jury trial. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these sorts of things with where the founding generation is coming from, where the revolutionaries are coming from, is that these are things that are fundamental to us. These are our natural rights. These are our rights that also that we have as members of the British Empire. And you, King, you, Parliament, all of you are abusing. And this is precisely why we need a revolution, why we need a new government, and why we have to use our most fundamental right of all, which is the right to abolish or alter a government that isn't securing our happiness and our security. I love that as like the, the thought of using, okay, we're going to abolish you as like the, your backup plan. Break glass in case of emergency. If your rights are being infringed and you cannot achieve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness because the government is stopping you, you get to use that break glass emergency abolish. So we were so concerned about this. It goes from the declaration into the constitution and it starts to be spelled out in that bill of rights. So can you walk us through kind of the spots in the Bill of Rights where if we wanted to say, if you want to look for civil liberties, you can look here or here or here. Sure, they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> that, that's what's amazing about the Bill of Rights. Even before we get the Bill of Rights, to the Bill of Rights, Curry, remember there were some protections of basic civil liberties even in the original constitution. And so we have protections like, you know, limiting the national government's power to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. So this is this big right that allows any of us, you said, I like the way you said it, Curry, show me the body. This is the idea <laughs> that if we're arrested, if we're thrown in, in jail, we can, can file this writ, this piece of paper saying, you government have to tell me why I'm here. You have to justify why you're holding me. And if you can't, then that violates my basic rights. And so this is this basic right of habeas corpus. The original constitution also has a right in the criminal jury trial. So there are some civil liberties there, but it's with the bill of rights where we really, really begin to see these spelled out. And as I said, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And the, remember, the Bill of Rights was absolutely essential to making this new government work. It was a response to the anti-federalists complaining that in creating a new government, a new national government, you're giving it too much power. It's going to consolidate all power from the states. It's going to abuse our, our most precious liberties. We just had fought a revolution to get rid of an empire. Why do we want a new, distant, powerful national government if we're going to create it? You have to make sure you spell out our most basic liberties in a Bill of Rights. Our state constitutions have them. Our national constitution has to have it too. And so, Curry, yeah, that's the Virginia Declaration of Rights. That's fine. But let, let's go to the Bill of Rights. Let's go to the Bill of Rights and see where these civil liberties are. And so this is an initial attempt by the founding generation with James Madison in the first Congress, really putting together the first drafts of the Bill of Rights, really shepherding it through Congress, trying to say, what is it that we find most fundamental? And so we see the individual rights here. There are things like the Second Amendment right uh, to, to keep and bear arms, as it's been interpreted over time by many scholars and ultimately by the Supreme Court, that a core part of this right is the right to self-defense. And especially under Supreme Court cases like Heller, like McDonald, which have been over the last couple decades, it's a fundamental, it's, it's a right uh, of self-defense in your home. So it's that form of protection that you have that individual right that attaches to you because of the Second Amendment. With the Fourth Amendment, we, we begin with you know, some of your rights when you are being investigated or accused of a crime. And so this is a right to privacy in yourself, your home, your places, your things. So the Fourth Amendment speaks of those particular things that we cherish most from a perspective of, pri of, of privacy, things like your body, your home, your various things. And what do you have a right against? Unreasonable searches and seizures by the government. And so the big idea for the Fourth Amendment is that if the government wants to search your house, it wants to search your things, it wants to, it wants to search you, it needs a good reason. It can't just do it for no reason. It needs a good reason because we value those things so, so greatly. 
Um, as we get into the Fifth and Sixth Amendments, we see sort of a bundle of rights. You know, on the one hand, we see many rights of the accused in the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. And so, you know, if we think today, what is one of the most fundamental things we believe as Americans? It's be we believe in the presumption of innocence. We believe that you're innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. We don't just treat citizens who haven't been convicted by a jury of a crime as walking criminals. We just don't allow that. And so the Fifth and Sixth Amendments are about protecting you if you're accused of a crime, at least in part. So, you know, these are things like uh, the right against self-incrimination. This is what we'll talk about the Miranda case later today, but this is, you know, the right to remain silent and all that. The government can't force a confession out of you, can't force you to testify against yourself. They have to prove their case against you. In the Sixth Amendment, we have all sorts of rights associated with a jury trial in criminal cases. And so for the founding generation, the jury was absolutely essential. This was a major protection against abu an abusive government. They were worried about government prosecutors, government judges, maybe going after political dissenters, maybe using the laws and the power of the state to go after people who were criticizing the government and treating you unfairly. And so what was the great protection of that? What was the bulwark of our liberties? It was the jury right. It was that the government, the prosecutor, the judge, they were going to have, the prosecutor was going to have to make the case before a jury of your peers, an impartial jury, a jury that's drawn from where you're accused of that crime. And so this is a major protection for you if you were accused of a crime. That, that trial has to be speedy. You have to have an impartial jury. It has to take place roughly where the crime took place. And you have to draw the jury from that area as well. And then finally, with the Fifth Amendment, we see two other big rights there that have less to, well, well, two, two other big rights that I'd want to flag. One is you see a takings clause. So this is a protection of our property rights. This is that the government can only take your property for public use if it gives you just compensation. And so this is a recognition that property rights were at the absolute core of what it meant to be a free person in the United States. Having those property rights and the government can't take them away. They can't take your property it, unless it's for a proper government use and, in, and, and that the government gives you money for that property. And then the last one there, Curry, in many ways, is the most fundamental of all. And it radiates almost out on a lot of the other rights we've already talked about. And this is the right to what we say is due process of law, that the government can't take away your life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And so fundamentally, what this ends up meaning is we need a fair process. We need a fair procedure. If the government's going to do something big, which is to take away your life, take away your liberty, maybe throw you in prison or take away your property, there has to be a fair process there. So on the one hand, Curry, you're looking at the Fifth, Sixth Amendment, even the Fourth Amendment to an extent, that's about providing fairness, but this is an additional thing in there saying, no, 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 it really has to be fair. Yeah, and when that's kind of like the big aha I had when looking at all these parts of the Constitution, all these cases, is we're trying to just make sure that our rights are spelled out, that the individual is protected to be able to achieve, you know, what we spell out in the declaration, which is to tell all Americans, because Amanda asked, like, you know, this declaration is written for all Americans saying why we're breaking up with England, because we want to be able to achieve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But then in our documents to spell out, okay, if, if there is a conflict, it needs to be a fair and just system that we, that we follow and really kind of defining that. So I guess when civil liberties come up today, we're still asking that question. We're still saying, is this system fair and just? Is there a process? You know, I always like the baseball term, trust the process, very Philadelphia, but trust the process. Um, and is that process transparent? Like all those big ideas are in there. Make, that's what makes you believe in the process and makes you feel it's fair, even if you don't like the outcome, is if you understand it, if it's applied equally, and if it is not overstepping boundaries. So I love this idea, but Tom, as we think about like kind of spelling this out, this sounds perfect. It sounds like it should have worked like that, but it's kind of something missing here, right? Like these, this Bill of Rights at this time, it only applies to the federal government. So the national government has to make sure I have due process. The national government has to make sure I have a trial by jury, all these pieces, but what, What's happening across the country? Are we seeing kind of the civil liberties being stepped on by state governments? Yeah, Curry. So for, again, yeah, for the founding generation, remember, for them, you know, for many of them, at least, and especially the anti-federalists, they're concerned about a national government. They don't think their national government's going to really represent and protect them and protect their liberties. 
And so that's why the Bill of Rights is only applying against the national government. There's a trust in the states with the idea that state governments are the closest to the people. And so because of that, they're most likely to really protect the liberties of the people. They have their own declaration of rights, et cetera. What we learn, and, and if we want to maybe fast forward to the Civil War and Reconstruction, I hate to you know, have to jump ahead, but I mean, one of the lessons of the Civil War and Reconstruction that President Lincoln learns, that his party, the, the Reconstruction Republicans learn, and that they try to write into the Constitution, especially with the 14th Amendment, is that states can abuse rights too. And so for them, they're thinking of this from multiple perspectives. One, didn't the, didn't the, didn't the Southern states just secede? <laughs> you know, what's more destructive of union and the ability of the union to protect the liberty of everyone than the fact that some people just wanna leave the country altogether and take their land and everything else with them. But then, you know, more in, in a way, I can't say more fundamentally, but for many of, the, uh, for many of that generation, just as important, they look back to before the Civil War and they see states not keeping up their end of the bargain. So that, again, the National Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights we think of today, didn't apply to the states. And what did, this, uh, what did the states do? Well, we see, especially white Southern governments, abusing some of our most cherished civil liberties. So things like passing laws that make abolitionist speech, preaching, meetings illegal. So if you're gonna advocate the end of slavery in the South, it's illegal prior to the Civil War in various states. They make it illegal to teach enslaved people to read. They make certain assemblies of African-Americans in church illegal in certain states. And so these key civil liberties, speech, assembly, press, religion, being violated by state governments. And so you'll see people like John Bingham, who's behind me here, the primary author of section one of the 14th Amendment, and there he is right there. Uh, you know, this is when he's talking about why do we need a 14th Amendment? One of the key reasons are all of these white Southern governments prior to the Civil War violating the rights that we cherish most. So if the founding generation warned us rightly that the national government can violate our rights and that we need a Bill of Rights, it's the Civil War and the experience prior to the Civil War that's teaching us be careful about states too. We also need those fundamental liberties to apply. We need the national, national constitution to apply to the states. And then finally, Kerry, I saw you already have the slide up. You know, after the Civil War, as we get into Reconstruction, we see the, we see, um, you know, Southern governments run by many ex-Confederates um, uh, right after the Civil War impose the Black Codes. And so these are laws that are, so we, we have, you know, enslaved people, uh, African-Americans are, are free, the institution of slavery is being destroyed, but you see state governments run by ex-Confederates trying to put African-Americans in the South back in conditions that are very much like slavery. They're making it difficult for them to, 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 to uh, enter into contracts, own property, pursue the professions they like, have, have the right to keep and bear arms. And so, that, you know, how do we know this? Well, Congress has also, the Congress itself is investigating the conditions in the South. So they have testimony from African-Americans and various people living down there talking about all of the abuses of African-American rights. But we also have African-Americans themselves meeting in convention in state after state, talking about what is it that is going wrong in post-Civil War America? And what does the national government have to do? What do we, the people, have to do to our constitution to ensure genuine liberty and equality for everyone, including African-Americans in the South? And so in part, this is what the 14th Amendment becomes about. So the 14th Amendment, I always like to say, in, 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 and, and uh, you know, that, that, it, that it ends up writing the promise of freedom and equality into the Constitution, really writing the Declaration's promise into the Constitution. But for our purposes, for civil liberties, so this is that, that language you see there, that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of, the, of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. What this ends up being about more than anything, and, and Representative Bingham, who was the author of this language, would say it most of all, this is about making sure so many of the fundamental rights we wrote into the Bill of Rights, free speech, religious liberty, to the right to keep and bear arms, the, right of, the rights of the accused, the right to a jury trial, that those are going to apply to the states. We can't trust the states anymore. We are a skeptical people about government power at all levels. I love that. I feel like Bingham basically says, okay, people, we clearly have to say it again. Like we have to say it again for this. Repeat country. after me, exactly, with me. Repeat yes. after me, it applies to all of you. So this idea that it applies to all of you doesn't happen right away. You know, the 14th Amendment gets passed and the idea, Bingham's idea that it applies to all of us doesn't really happen right away. It happens 
and this is kind of a weird way to say, but piecemeal, part by part. Um, and that's what we call, in the, here's the word of the day, incorporation. So when we incorporate the Bill of Rights to apply to the individual and through the state, that's incorporation, but it's not, okay, all of a sudden the Bill of Rights are my blanket. It's one by one, they start to incorporate it. So can you, and I know we need, we have 10 minutes left. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of how do we start to incorporate it? And there's some steps forward and steps yeah. back with applying it to the individual, the, all the Bill of Rights through the 14th Amendment. Yeah, no, that's great, Curry. You know, the one thing to note is that the first wave of Supreme Court cases under the 14th Amendment ends up really limiting the reach of the 14th Amendment. It delays this project of incorporation and has us really read the 14th Amendment quite narrowly. These are cases like the Slaughterhouse cases, the case Curry has there, United States versus Cruikshank. And so the Supreme Court is initially, this project of incorporation is put off until the 20th century. But you know, what happens is we learn as so many, you know, as we learn so many times, sometimes a single prophetic voice can make a difference. And so even during this period where the Supreme Court is speaking in ways that are limiting the reach of the 14th Amendment, we see dissenters in the slaughterhouse cases. We see a key dissent by Justice John Marshall Harland in a case called Hurtado, where he lays out a, a, a robust theory of incorporation that ultimately Justice Hugo Black, you know, almost 100 years later would pick up in the 20th century during the Warren Court to say that no, 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 the 14th Amendment really does apply the Bill of Rights against the states. And you know, this process, you're right, Curry, it takes, it, it takes place, it's piece by piece, takes place over time. I think it really begins for real in 1925 with a case called Gitlo, which is where the court initially is saying, no, the First Amendment's protection of free speech, that does apply to the states, it's quite fundamental. And then it's piece by piece, you see the court pick up more of the First Amendment on and on and on. But an interesting thing happens. So in these early cases, what you see the court do, so a case like Gitlow take, you know, the court says, yes, 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 free speech, fundamental, applies against the states. But by the way, the defendant here still loses. And so you have this thing where the court's applying these rights and saying they apply to the states, but applying them in really stingy ways. And so when we talk about the incorporation revolution beginning, especially in the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, and the Warren Court, the Warren Court's doing two big things. So that's Earl Warren. You could also, you know, you could have a, a picture next to him of Justice Hugo Black, who is the great proponent of incorporation. He's the key prophetic voice on the court. But the Warren Court's doing two big things. It's getting more and more of the rights in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights incorporated. But then it's doing another really, really big thing. It's reading those rights in a really robust way. The protections have real bite. We really are striking down state laws that violate these rights. We really are overturning convictions if we're violating the rights of the accused. And so we see in cases, you know, ranging from, you know, take, you know, free speech cases that we talk about sometimes like Brandenburg, where it's both an, an incorporation case because it's attacking an Ohio law, a state law, but it's also reading the First Amendment right in a way, way more speech protective way than we've seen before. So maybe should we give a couple of examples of this war in court revolution to get a sense of how it, how it works? I, we can start with Gideon. I think Gideon's a fantastic story, but also, and I, I love Miranda because Miranda's not a good guy, but civil liberties still apply to not good people. So the facts of the case that he's not a good guy don't apply here. When we look at civil liberties, we all have them. They are our rights. And who we are as a person doesn't matter. Who we are as a, as a citizen and as an individual does. So I love this because it really helps our students look at what are the facts that matter when looking at the constitutional questions. So which one do you want to start with, Gideon? Let's, or let's come Miranda? chronologically. So let's start Gideon. So it's 1963. Okay. There's Clarence Earl Gideon. And this really is just one of the most amazing stories in the history of the Supreme Court. So here's Clarence Earl Gideon. So what's the crime? What happened here? Well, someone robbed a pool hall in Florida. And so, you know, what did they do? Well, they took some beer, took some wine, took some change out of the, I think the cigarette machine in the jukebox. So we're not exactly talking about the crime of the century here, but Clarence Earl Gideon, he's, he's accused of this crime. And who's he? Well, he's about 50 years old. Um, he's already been convicted of four different crimes. He spent a lot of his time in jail. I think he spent a total of 17 years in jail prior to this one. He's, you know, sort of a grifter, a gambler, a petty criminal. You know, if you were to ask the people who knew him in prison, they would say, yeah, you know, he breaks the law sometimes, but he's, Fundamentally, he's not dangerous. He's a good guy, maybe misunderstood. Um, but so the, here's Gideon. 
Gideon's accused of this crime in a way, a lifelong criminal. And so he goes to court in Florida and he says, you know, to the judge, I'm representing myself because I can't afford a lawyer. You know, I'd like, I'm, I'm invoking the Sixth Amendment. I have a right to counsel under the Sixth Amendment. And so I want a right to a lawyer. And what the judge says is, well, under Florida law, we only give free counsel to people who can't afford it in basically death penalty cases, the most serious of the serious crimes. And so Florida, in this sense, it's, it, it's, it's one of the few states that does this. Many, 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 the majority of other states would give counsel in this situation to someone who's poor. But Florida still, you know, under a Supreme Court precedent, it was allowed to have a different rule. And so it limited free counsel to cases in, in, in when there's a death penalty. And so Clarence Earl Gideon, he represents himself. He's found guilty, gets five years in prison. And then when he gets to prison, though, like so many, uh, you know, so many prisoners, he, he becomes a jailhouse lawyer. So he begins to study the Constitution. He begins to study the law. And he decides, you know what? I really think I have a claim here under the Sixth Amendment. And so what he does, he takes a piece of paper, writes in pencil his argument, his petition to the court. The court gets it. It's this handwritten petition, again, in pencil. And they take it. I know, that part it, blows my mind. I know, <laughs> they, they take it seriously. They say, you know what? It may not look like it, but this is a, this is a writ of habeas corpus. And you know what? We justices, it's like any other one. We, we, we're going to get together in our Friday conference with Clarence Earl Gideon's handwritten petition, and we're going to argue about it. And ultimately, the Supreme Court takes this case. Now, to be clear, the Supreme Court was looking to take up an, this issue in the proper case that came before it, and this seemed to so squarely present it. And what happens to Gideon? So the court takes the case. Gideon is then represented by one of the great lawyers in Washington, D.C. at the time, Abe Fortas who would become a justice in his own right. So Gideon went from having to represent himself in Florida court to now having one of the greatest lawyers in the country appointed by the Supreme Court to argue his case. And so it's argued Gideon himself is still in jail while it's being argued. But the Supreme Court ultimately, in a unanimous decision written by Hugo Black says, amazingly, Gideon's petition's right. There is a violation of a fundamental right here, of a civil liberty, this right to counsel. And so because of that, the Supreme Court overrules a case from a couple decades earlier called Betts. And it says, you know what? We are going to incorporate this Sixth Amendment protection through the 14th Amendment to apply to the states. We're going to throw out Clarence Earl Gideon's conviction. And we're going to say this Florida law is unconstitutional because what's the big point here? What is Hugo Black and the court really arguing? And I'm gonna borrow from our, our great friend Akil Lamar here. I love the way he frames this. And he says, you know, we, we, we as a court and we as a nation, we don't want to convict people because they're poor. We want to convict people because they're guilty. And the best way to ensure that we get those things right is to make sure that both sides are represented by good counsel, including just as much the poor as the rich, just as much the poor as the state itself. And so with that, we end up with this unbelievable story. And so what's the practical outcome? Gideon ends up tried again. So that, that conviction is thrown out. Florida tries him for the same offense again. And we have the same witnesses the same evidence, the same court, the same judge, the same sort of jury. The big difference here, Gideon gets a lawyer and he's acquitted. He is found not guilty of this crime. And so it's an un there's a reason why they made a Hollywood movie out of it. There's a reason why there's a best-selling book called Gideon's Trumpet by Anthony Morris. I was going to say, Gideon's but it's Trumpet an amazing is a great story. one. It is unbelievable. And, you know, but, and this is why I think I want to end with Miranda. Again, sometimes, it, like, I love that story, but it also sounds very fairy tale. It's, a, it's an awful story, but it has such a, like, a wonderful kind of, like, and we triumph. Um, when we look at these stories and we're putting our students in the head of, you know, we're, we're thinking about our opinions, we're thinking about our constitutional questions, we need to look really closely on the facts that matter in this case. And this case was chosen to really understand what are the facts that matter under the law. And so, we, and we have two minutes left. Give us a real quick summary of Miranda because it's a very different type of case. It's, you know, it's not gonna make you feel warm and fuzzy, but fairness and equality under the law matters and understanding the law matters too and understanding your individual rights. Sure, so Miranda, it's, it's, you know, it's, what's, it, it's what's called the right against self-incrimination. So going to the question of, you know, can the state force you to confess? Um, and so, you know, the Miranda case, it, 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 it arises out of broader concerns on the court about abuses by police officers of people in custody. So, you know, in a lot of ways, what's on the court's mind is what's happening across the South. 
where you see a lot of African-American defendants brought in and abused by police officers in the South. And so that's on their mind. But, you know, Ernesto Miranda, he's, you know, a young Latino man. He's poorly educated um, and he's accused of, of a serious crime. And so he's brought in, um, you know, he's and, and, and what they do is they, you know, rather than it being a case of him being beaten or there being, you know, physical violence in that sense, which we certainly see in other cases, what they do is they try to trick him. So they set up a police lineup. They bring in a witness and the witness has Miranda and other, you know, other folks around. And they ask, they ask her, you know, it, it, you know, which which person, you know, is the is you know committed the crime here? And she tells the police, it could be Miranda, but I'm not really sure. And so what the police do is they go in the back and they say, she's got you, you were identified, you know, you're done. And Miranda says, oh, okay, I'll confess to the crime then. Um, and so he, he confesses to it, and then he's ultimately convicted of this crime. But then he challenges it. He challenges it because, he, you know, his lawyers argue he has a right against self-incrimination. He has, he has a right to appointed counsel, which we just saw from Gideon. Both these things, he didn't know it. And as a result of that, those rights were violated. And so the court here in a five to four decision says that Miranda and his lawyers, they were right. Here, what the court's really looking to do is it's looking to move from an old test, was, which was really fuzzy, to a really bright line, clear test. And what the court says famously, this is what you see in those police procedural shows. You have the right to remain silent. Everything, anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. You have a right to an attorney, all of those sorts of things. That Miranda warning you see on television, that comes from the Miranda case. That's from Chief Justice Earl Warren's opinion in this case. And what the court's saying here is that, you know, in, in the end, I love the way Warren says it. I just want to find it. It's Earl Warren, in his opinion, says it is not admissible to do a great thing by doing a little wrong. And so he's saying, even if you think you have the right person, it doesn't mean you can break the rules. And here it is, it is not sufficient to do justice by obtaining a proper result by irregular or improper means. And so what the Warren Court's trying to do is to try to give police officers and the government more broadly, a clear standard, a clear way to make sure that uh, defendants' rights aren't violated. And it's saying, you know, if you're gonna arrest someone, take them into custody, you have to read them their rights. They have to know their rights. That's the proper way to ensure against, you know, confessions by people who are not guilty. And there are all sorts of reports, there are commissions, all sorts of things saying that the, the way that this is done now, we see too much violence and we see too many people who otherwise are innocent saying that they're guilty just to stop the coercion stop the violence. And we do not want that. That is not consistent with the Constitution of the United States. And I love when Warren says that because what he's saying is the process that it goes through has to be fair, not just have a good end game and, and a good end outcome. And when we look at kind of cases that evolve these questions today, I will say, check out the Equal Justice Initiative and Just Mercy from Brian Stevenson. That's kind of like the modern look at, is this a fair process along the way for everybody? Tom, that was an excellent class. I really enjoyed it. The students were really chatty in there. Um, did uh, Miranda go to jail after the court case and Riley fought? Go ahead. He did actually, he, and he ends up getting convicted. It's an amazing, so just quickly, can I get a coda on this guy yeah, yeah. just to answer that? Yeah. So, so Miranda thinks I'm at, you know, I, 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 I'm, you know, I'm going to get out of prison. His dad buys them a bottle of whiskey to celebrate. Um, but Miranda makes a huge mistake. So what he does is he's, you know, he, 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 he uh, gets in touch with his common law wife and says, you know, I'm going to get out of prison and you know what, I'm going to take our kids and go away. And she's not happy about this. And the problem for Miranda is prior to that, he actually confessed to this particular crime to his wife. And so what she does is, all right, you're going to be like that. Well, I'm going to tell the police what you said. And she did. This confession is then used against him when he's retried and he's convicted. Awesome. And it, uh, it, not an awesome ending. That's no. um, and I know he has a sordid story after that as well. But the idea is that this, when we look at the Constitution and we look at these stories and we look at how the law changes, um, what we like to look at is, all these people that fit into the American national tree to move our this idea of civil liberties forward. And sometimes it can be, you know, the greatest heroes and the greatest stories, and sometimes really hard stories, but they move us forward as a country to understanding civil rights, civil liberties, and what does it really mean to have a just and fair system and process. So thank you so much, Tom. That was awesome. I love these stories. We've got to look at the goods and the bads and all that we learn from it in these cases and look for the facts and the evidence in the case and is the constitution being upheld. 
So thank you students so much. Great questions. Amanda, if you wanna hang for the 14th Amendment section four, we can do that next. I'm just gonna stop the recording. Everybody have a great day. Thanks everyone.